Hey everybody, it's David or Javian again. It's so great to see you, or even better yet, it's great for you to see me. Uh, we're almost in the middle of August. It's hard to believe this summer is going by so fast, but I think we're all glad it's going by so fast. We have a great program tonight, Sharon Lucky. We're always, we're always happy to see Sharon Lucky uh, and, and listen to what she has to always tell us. So I'm gonna dispense with this pretty quickly uh, and, and turn this over to Richard to introduce Sharon, and I will see you after the review. Sharon Lucky is a children's author. Uh, she's a songwriter. She's a poet. She's traveled the nation uh, providing people with curriculum advice on the arts. Uh, lucky for us, she loves to review books, and she's got a great one this year. Um, the clubs have loved it. Uh, it's in first person. It's My Exaggerated Life, Pat Conroy. Uh, based on a series of interviews with Pat Conroy, the late author, the great Santini, uh, Prince of Tides. Uh, what a life and what a great presentation in first person by, by Sharon Lucky. You're going to love this one. So welcome, Sharon Lucky. It's wonderful to be with you. I wish I could see your faces. It's so inspiring to have an audience. But I am thankful to Richard Stanford and to David Rojabian for making this possible and for inviting me to be with you. I have a story to tell you, and I think we should just start out with it right now. These are the words that made it imperative for me to visit Charleston, South Carolina. I read them on page 12 of Pat Conroy's novel, South of Broad. The gardens of Charleston are mysteries, he wrote walled away in ivy jewel boxes emitting their special fragrances. Some had proven good to the magnolia that bloomed late. I passed one old 40-foot tree that looked as though a hundred white doves had gathered there in search of mates. My sense of smell lit up as the temperature rose and burned the dew off the tea olive and the jasmine, and my armpits moistened. I offered up my own scent to the streets where coffee brewed in hidden kitchens and the sound of my newspapers hitting the soft wood of verandas sounded like mullet jumping for joy in giant lagoons. I would see Charleston for myself. I'm reviewing today my exaggerated life, Pat Conroy, as told to Catherine Clark. I've wanted to do a Pat Conroy review for years, but I didn't find the right vehicle until this was published in 2018. And I think that Catherine Clark, who is an oral biography, biographer, I didn't know such people existed, did you? She gives the best explanation of the process in her preface. I'm going to share a little bit of it with you. She said that Pat Conroy called her one day and told her that a recent near-fatal health scare had made him determined to cooperate with a biographer before his demise. I told him, she said, that I knew scholarly biographies about him already existed. I wasn't the person to do another, but that I would love to do the kind of book I do in the subject's own words, unplugged and unpretentious. Let's do it, he said. And Pat just loves to talk. And he's one of those rare writers whose gift of spontaneous speech matches his gift for the written word. And he's the one who said it won't be the literal truth because I don't have a recording of my life. Indeed, who does? You might even say that no one wrote this book. It was my task to select and structure the words on the page. The words are his. And he had a heart that was huge and merry. I heard so many stories about him. This one from his daughter, Megan, saying that he had called a friend and got a wrong number 
one day and found himself talking to a complete stranger on the phone, a little old lady with whom he had a conversation for an hour and a half. In the course of it, he found out that she needed some groceries and didn't have a car. He asked for her grocery list. That's the Pat Conroy I came to know. She went on to say that even though oral biographies consist of memories and stories, there is editing and fact checking that happens and uh, episodes were corroborated to the extent possible. I had trusted aides for that. But most helpfully, Pat's wife, the incomparable Cassandra King Conroy, whose support and assistance was invaluable. I could not have been more thrilled than when she said the book sounded just like him. Now, for me personally, I'm going to say that this book is not like some of his other books, edited and re-edited and polished to perfection. And uh, here you'll find him blunt, plain-spoken, uncommonly candid. And there is a generous sprinkling of my least favorite four-letter words. If you know me, you know I'm a preacher's daughter. I've had my mouth washed out with lava soap for saying much less, and I won't <laughs> be including those words. But with those deletions, I'm going to tell you this story just as Pat Conroy told it to Catherine Clark, except for a couple of times when I need him to insert a little bit from another of his books I love, and then I will have him say, as any Southern gentleman would, that it is a request from Miss Sharon. It's my honor to finally get to review a Pat Conroy book, his last one. His books have sold 20 million worth worldwide. Four of them have been made into movies. He famously said that the greatest gift a writer can be given is to be born into an unhappy family. I could not have been born into a better one, he said. I didn't have to look for melodrama. It was always just right there. So now I'm going to uh, share with you some of the stories behind his stories. Here's Pat. I will never get over my ruined boyhood. It's a trauma I carry with me still, and there's nothing I can do about it. I'm the kid whose dad beat him blind, the kid who never hit back at the great Santini until he heard his dad beating up his mother. I've had crack ups, I've had breakdowns. I'm a two time loser at suicide. Each time I thought I'd killed myself only to wake up two days later. A failure, even at that. Don Conroy was a terrible father, but he was a crackerjack fighter pilot. His job was killing people and he was good at it. He grew up on the sh streets of Chicago, a dim-witted Irish Catholic who learned to use his fists on the street and later would use them on his family. My mother was born in the poorest deep white south that you can imagine. She almost starved during the Depression. World War II allowed each of them to pull themselves up from where they'd come. Dad becoming a Marine officer and mom marrying into the officer class. They were married in 1944. I was born too soon, 1945, before they were ready. My sister Carol was born 16 months later. And in the end, there would be seven of us in all, six miscarriages. We moved constantly during the early years. I went to 11 schools in 12 years, lived in 23 different places before we moved to Beaufort, South Carolina. I loved it the first minute I saw it. And because I was from nowhere and a part of nothing, I pretended I was from Beaufort, that golden city in the sun that I came to when I was 15. 
I loved it when Dad was called overseas. Korea, Vietnam, Mediterranean missions. Carol and I prayed for war every single year. When Dad was home, I was just a cadet following his orders. We were all a minor branch of my dad's command. I tried to please him. I never could. I wasn't man enough for him. He would beat me blind at any stage for any reason. I hadn't been in Buford very long before I was elected senior class president. <laughs> and I lettered in three sports. At that age, he still beat me up for playing poor defense or getting a sportsmanship award, which he considered sissy. You're soft like your mother, he'd say. He never told me he loved me, not once in my life. And he mocked everything I wrote. Small wonder that my brilliant sister Carol became mentally ill and my little brother Tommy, who was schizophrenic, without help, did a backflip off a 14-story building and killed himself. But I loved my mom. She was a gorgeous woman, impeccably dressed, exciting too, when Dad wasn't around, and she read every book that ever came out. She read aloud to us. She acted out the books. She discussed them with us. And I can remember the intonation of her voice and the rhythm. If she was reading a man's voice, her voice would lower and the princess would get her most charming southern accent and the frog prince would have a scratchy voice. When I grew up later and started dating, my mom would always call me and it would be, I hear you're dating a young lady, son. Now, is she Catholic? You should have heard her when I dated two Southern Baptist preacher's daughters who <laughs> let their children go out with me because I called my dates, ma'am. Would you like some dessert, ma'am? Also, I was too shy to try anything improper. The second worst thing that happened to me in my young life is that my father got me into college at the Citadel. I wear the ring. I live to tell the story. And the story I told was a book called The Boo. And it was about the only decent faculty member I met in that cruel place. After I graduated, they fired the boo, sent him out to the warehouse to handle the luggage, order pens and pencils and toilet paper for the campus. I did the only thing I would always do when I encountered injustice. I wrote a book about it. It was a stupid book, a badly written book. Don't ever read it. But it was my first thrust toward art. It was banned on campus, of course, and no one came to the book signing. The institution and its graduates despised me for decades. But I went on to write two more books. Uh, the lose, my Losing Season and Lords of Discipline. Trying to purge myself, I think, of that place. You know, the, I got a C in creative writing there because Colonel Carpenter did not like the way I wrote. And he would mock it openly in class. I think Fat Jack Martin was the only faculty member that appreciated my writing. He taught the History of England class. And he'd write things on my paper like, I don't believe you have understood or uh, appreciated one fact of English history, but you write about your ignorance so beautifully. I could talk a long time about that experience, but Miss Sharon wants me to hurry on to pleasanter things. So that's a brief summary of my exaggerated life up to that point. In 1969, I went to teach in an all-black Gullah Sea Island. I thought I'd landed on one of the moons of Pluto, but I had just discovered America. I spent nine months of the best year of my life on Dalfuski Island. And the kids didn't know what to make of me when I showed up. 
They said, we never met no white teacher before, and what's a man teacher anyway? There was so much they didn't know. I was teaching fifth through eighth grades. They all tested at first grade level or below. And Miss Sharon says that this is one of her favorites of my early books. And this is a very well-worn copy she sent with me, so I think it's been read several times. She's requested that I give you an excerpt from it. And I don't pick up this book very often because it still hurts me a lot. But the water is wide, is uh, with me, so let's have an excerpt, shall we? I woke up the first morning on Dalfuski Island in the kitchen of the school because that's the only place available for me to stay. I shaved with cold water, no mirror, after tossing and turning all night long on a cot that smelled of chalk dust. I looked as good as I could for the arrival of the only other teacher on the island, Miss Brown. She hove into sight and called to me, Welcome overseas. And I said, thank you, ma'am. I'm thrilled to be here. And then she launched into a rather ferocious homily about the handling of black children by teachers so obviously white. I know how to treat young black kids because I am one myself. Now, I want you to look out there in all those trees. Each one got lots of switches. And as I was writing my name in very large letters on the chalkboard, she proceeded to tell me that for the younger children, which she taught, she preferred to discipline with a leather belt. So when the class drifted in, she addressed the congregation before saying a prayer. And then she announced me. It's my privilege to introduce to you babies your new teacher, Mr. Pat Roy. And after she left us, I'd had this great idea for an icebreaker. I told them to get a piece of paper and draw my white face. And I heard out of my left ear front row, Conrad think he look good. And another voice said, Conrad, he look bad. Conrad, I would be for the duration. I loved those students with my whole being. And I tried every trick in the book to help them understand that there were other cultures in this world and that the world was out beyond their beaches. I was often reprimanded by Miss Brown for my lack of discipline, but having been beaten my whole young life, I would never employ her methods. Well, come October, I found out that those sweet babies didn't know what Halloween was or trick-or-treating, and I became obsessed with taking them to Beaufort. This uh, entailed walking to each student's house, begging, arguing for a signed permission slip, it meant finding a boat that was big enough to take all 18 of us across the treacherous water, which they feared. It meant finding a bus to pick us up and take us to a high school gymnasium I would have to procure so we could spend the night, of course. I had to find a neighborhood where they would be welcome. The handfuls of Halloween candy. This is just one of the many brilliant ideas I had that year that would eventually get me fired. Now, I quit sleeping in the kitchen that year when I married Barbara. She'd been my neighbor uh, the year before. I once heard her trying to start her car in the parking lot, and some bad words came through my bathroom window. So I went down and started her car for her and commented on the salt of her tongue and noticed she was wearing a wedding ring. I found out about a month later that her Marine pilot husband had been shot down over in Vietnam. And he left her with a little girl and another on the way. This was a time for me to rescue a damsel in distress. And we married quickly, honeymooned on Dufuski. 
And I began taking my life in my hands on many occasions to get home to Barbara when the water was wide. So, getting fired was devastating on many levels. I had three little girls under five now at home to support because I'd adopted Barbara's two and she'd not gone back to work after having our daughter Megan. It was also devastating because I lost teaching. So early in my career, I think it's the most honorable profession you can have. I never got back to it. I did apply for every teaching position that became available, but it soon became apparent to me that I would never again teach in that state. I had to look elsewhere, so I ended up on a chicken farm one day. And the farmer looked me up and down. He said, you ain't a teacher they fired over there at Buford, are you? When I admitted it, he said, I'm sorry, son. I got to hire me someone I can trust with my chickens. So I ended up on a shrimping boat as a striker at the back. I opened up the nets. I separated the fish from the shrimp. And they paid me in seafood. That's what we ate that summer. I loved those shrimpers and their families. I loved being on the bays, the ocean, the rivers. And I would go home every afternoon and write. I wrote The Water is Wide in a blaze of fury. I thought I was being punished for loving those children and their families. I took it to court. I lost. I just kept writing five handwritten legal yellow pages a day. That's how I've written all my books, by the way. I figured I knew a little bit about the commerce of book selling um, since I'd written the boo. It actually made a little money. So you go to the bank, you borrow uh, cash, and you take it to a printer who gives you back a book, and you schlep it around and sell it. So I was going to do that again when I ran into a fellow who was smarter than me and he said, who's your agent? I didn't think you could have an agent if you were an unknown and in fact you can't. But he gave me the name and phone number of his agent, Julian Bach, a name well known to everyone in the publishing business apparently except me. I was smart enough to know that I would have to get past his secretary to talk to him. So I called her. I said, you don't know me, ma'am, but I'm Mr. Bach's first cousin, and his favorite uncle has died, and he doesn't know it. It was sudden. So when she connects us, I'm introduced to Julian Bach's phone manners. Who is this? How'd you get my secretary to connect us? I will fire her for this. And I'd written out what I wanted to say. I always do that when I'm nervous, so I started reading. Hello, Mr. Bach. My name is Pat Conroy. I've, uh, I'm from Beaufort, South Carolina. I've written a book I think you might enjoy. I've seldom heard of South Carolina, and I've certainly never heard of Beaufort. How did you get my number? Don't you ever call it again. I have losers like you calling me every day of the week. Bam, he hung up on me. That went so well, I decided to write him a letter. Dear Mr. Bach, obviously your soul has shrunk in the canyons of New York City. In the alleyways and darknesses you travel through every day on the way to work. I had no idea he did that, but obviously he did that. <laughs> So I continued, whatever your mother thought on the day you were born, she had no idea what a small demon she'd created. Such discourtesies and rudenesses I have never encountered in my life and hope I never do again. He liked my letter and he called me to apologize, said he'd been rather proud of the fact that he'd never had a client from the South, which led me to tell him that my book was about teaching on an all-black Gullah Sea Island. And he told me later, I got his attention with that. So he said, I, uh, 
I'll take a look at your book. I will. It's Monday now. Have it here for the weekend read. And I said, what's the weekend read? And he said, figure it out. Boom. Hung up on me. So about uh, the next week, I got a call from him. And he said, Pat, I haven't had a chance to read your book, but the girls in the office think it's the cutest thing we've ever seen. And he laughed and hung up on me. Well, I had no written manuscript, was what he was so tickled about. And so um, I started to send it up handwritten. My, my wife and my mother said no. They called everybody they knew in Buford who could type. And I'd hear, this is just one chapter, but we need it back by next tomorrow about this time because it needs to go to New York City for the weekend read. That's how it got there. The next day, they started coming in, those chapters. One was on onion skin, one was on bright yellow paper, one was on short blue sheets. Fonts like Elite, uh, Pica. One was script on personal stationery. I had just glued it all together and sent it in. Evidently, that got their attention. So about three weeks later, I, uh, I get a nice letter on stationery, company stationery, and it says, Dear Mr. Conroy, whom we fondly call Conrack around the office, I think you're a natural writer. I think this is the first of many books. I hope our association is a long one. It would be. I did the eulogy for his funeral 30 years later. And just not very long after that, I get a call from Julian Bach and he says, I have great news for us both. Houghton Mifflin wants to buy your book. And into my stunned silence, he added, Pat Houghton Mifflin is the publisher of Henry James and Edith Wharton and Henry David Thoreau and Emily Dixonson and Ralph Waldo Emerson and now Pat Conroy. And here's the best part, $7,500. And I said, I can get it done a lot cheaper down here. Julian, just let me do it. What? What did you say? I can get the book done a lot cheaper down here. Let me, let me do it. Now, Pat, you do understand that it is they who pay you. He never let me forget that. Not as long as he lived. Well, the next call I get from him, he says that uh, Life Magazine wants to do an article. And they have sent someone to the island to verify everything. And when that article was printed, Hollywood bought my book for a movie. Hollywood. And he calls me. He said, you need to get to New York City. So I climb into my 68 yellow Volkswagen and I drive leisurely up there. I stop in to see a couple of guys from the... Citadel, and he calls my wife in a panic, and she says, oh, he's on his way. What do you mean he's on his way? When does his plane get in? <laughs> he's driving. Is he crazy? I needed him here right now. Well, I get to New York, and I don't know where to stay. I'd heard the YMCA was cheap, so I called him from there, and he yells at me again. Get out of there before you're robbed or worse. Call a cab. Well, the movie was entitled Conrack, starring John Voight. And it was shot on St. Simon's Island because my hometown of Beaufort not only did not ask me for a book signing, they didn't want the movie shot there either. And they would soon realize their mistake. Now, I have to make a confession at this point. I was not ready for this sudden fame. 
I had no idea that being a writer would attract women. I'd never really dated. And as my world and my marriage fell apart, I realized how I should have been paying attention to Barbara and those sweet girls at home. You cannot understand how much I regret it. I was just a dreary piece of garbage, that's all. But Barbara went on to have a successful career as a lawyer and I had given her reason to leave me, but it still hurt that she did not invite me to her big day, her graduation. She's always been grateful that I paid for law school and didn't steal her thunder on that occasion. And we have a strong relationship now. But that is a very deep regret. Houghton Mifflin was very happy and grateful for the success of that book. They wanted me to write another one like it. I had a novel burning through me and that didn't make them happy. It wouldn't end up making me happy either. But I, I had to write it and before I did, I had to come clean with what my father had been and what our lives had been like. What a lie we'd lived him calling us the Magnificent Seven. I had never revealed to anyone about the abuse I went through as a child and a youth, not even my wife. And to reveal that, I was going to have to play Judas Iscariot to my family. I didn't begin to tell the whole truth. I skimmed over so much of it. Oh. Even so, I was shocking people. My editor, for instance, said, that isn't even believable. America isn't ready for this story. I wrote it anyway. The great Santini <laughs> split me open, spilled me out on the floor, and threw me into the office of Dr. Marion O'Neill. I cried uncontrollably when I wrote the last chapter of this book. I cried for days. And I was embarrassed to need a therapist. I was a southern male of the non-therapeutic breed. I wore the ring. I was the son of a fighter pilot. But Dr. Marion O'Neill saved my life. One of the many things she told me was that my cure would come through my writing. And she said, you haven't begun to dig. Keep digging. When The Great Santini was published, it just exploded all over the place. I had underestimated the fury of a family who did not want to read about or remember their past. But strangely enough, even though the book is critical of my father, he backed me up. That was the beginning of a new relationship for us. At the launch party, somebody brought the book up to him and had him sign it, and it just changed everything. Now he wants to go to the book signings with me and sit beside me and be witty and charming and funny, the person I had never known in my life. He'd nudge me sometimes and say, my line's longer than yours. When the movie came out, though, my family was won over. So was Buford. This time, they filled up the motels, the restaurants. Mom called me. Oh, Robert Duvall is coming next week, and they've rented a house for him, she said. And when she found out Blythe Danner was playing her, she called again. They've rented the house next to the one that we lived in. My father? would never get over the fact that Robert Duvall played him. Now I've got two best-selling books and they've been made into movies. I should be on cloud nine. No. I'm suffering a great depression, missing my family, feeling like a failure over my divorce. And I was going to my therapist five days a week. I was writing 
every minute I wasn't in her office like she told me to. I needed something else. I decided to take up cooking <laughs> as therapy. Have you ever thought of that? Well, you see, when Barbara went off to law school, she said with a little mischievous look on her face, Oh, by the way, you're in charge of the evening meals now. I thought it was fair enough, but I didn't know how to boil an egg, and she knew it. My mother was a terrible cook. She thought cooking was slave labor. I mean, we lived on the seacoast. If I would come in there with a fresh catch of fish, cleaned and ready to go, she'd hold her nose. Get those smelly things out of my kitchen, young man. <laughs> she dealt with the Catholic tradition of fish on Friday by feeding her rowdy family frozen fish sticks for the approximately 500 Friday nights of my childhood. Well, I went to my favorite bookstore and I asked my favorite bookstore uh, seller for a, a suggestion. I said, I'm now in charge of the evening meal for my family. Do you have a suggestion? He said, call 911. And then he pointed me to the Escoffier cookbook which is a daunting uh, introduction for the beginner. I had no idea as I walked out of there with that book under my arm that the first thing I was going to have to learn how to do was make stock. Clear stock, vegetable stock, chicken stock, veal stock, fish stock, beef stock. And they should always be in the freezer ready to go. And then I had to go to a lot of cooking classes and I became totally immersed in it to the point that I wrote the Pat Conroy cookbook. This has a lot of stories in it that connect to the recipes. You can tell by the porky picture on the front that I tested them well. And I've been asked recently if the recipe for funeral shrimp is in here. Someone in my audience knew that I took pickled shrimp to every good friend's funeral. A dozen if it was a good friend. Two dozen if it was a great friend. And of course, I've requested them for my funeral as well. So yes, that recipe is in here. And by now, something inside of me says, what is wrong with you? You seem happy. That wasn't my natural state. Even my therapist said that chaos was my comfort zone. And I threw myself right into the battle of the soul because I was attracting women again. I think because I could now cook, but I didn't like dating. You put me in a room full of beautiful women, I would gravitate toward the one with the saddest story. Every time. So, when I met Lenore, I knew that she was a problem. She was neurotic. She had a reputation for craziness, but she was beautiful. She was a New Yorker, and I love New Yorkers. She was Jewish, and I love Jews. And she was troubled, best of all. Divorced from her wealthy neurosurgeon husband. And I'm not going to tell you too much about this courtship. <clears throat> her husband became obsessed with me, her ex-husband. He said he felt like she still belonged to him. His children told me that he had a full set of my books, first edition, signed in his home. That being said, he did not want me around his ex-wife or his children. And there was a night when I had to channel my great Santini and I put him headfirst into Lenore's front shrubbery. And when he extricated himself, he climbed into his new Porsche, called the police, and uh, had me thrown in jail. I was incarcerated for about five hours while my lawyer posted bail. I got acquainted with the other gentleman in the holding cell. I asked each one of them what he was in for. All but one were in for back child support, so I paid them all out to the street, except the one. He said, they say I strangled my wife with my belt. Did you do it, I said. 
yeah, yeah. And I said, good luck to you, sir. Somewhere between writing Lords of Discipline and The Prince of Tides, I ruined my life by marrying Lenore. I genuinely felt sorry for her and for her children. But um, my publisher sold the paperback rights to Lords of Discipline for $695,000 and split it with me. So then it was made into a movie. I had enough money to take her and her children and live in Italy so I wouldn't have to spend all my time in court being sued by her ex-husband. I loved it there. That was a great good gift of all this mess. I had an office overlooking the Forum in Campidoglio. I walked the streets of Rome. I got to know that city. I got to know about the cities buried beneath that city. Um, it was a wonderful time for me to write. And my daughter Megan came to stay with us. My stepdaughters came to visit. It was a strange mix, Lenore and her very perfect son and her very troubled daughter. And in the midst of that three years, Lenore went off birth control to my surprise. And our daughter Susanna was born there. And she was the miracle of my middle age. Now, I started writing Prince of Tides there. And that may seem strange because of the setting, but I carry Buford and Charleston with me everywhere I go. And I had memorized the Low Country. I had a deep devotion to that part of the, my world. And that's where I set this book. I also wanted another crack at that family that I had uh, introduced in the great Santini. I, I'd let myself down. I let the editors talk me into putting in niceties that my father had not done, would never do. I mentioned them to him. He said, oh, that's my favorite part. And I said, you didn't do any of that, Dad. I made it up. <laughs> so. Back in New York at Houghton Mifflin, they had a new editor named Nan Talese. If that sounds familiar, she was part of a power couple. Gay Talese is a famous author. She called me, and in her very pristine way, she said, uh, we are prepared to offer twice as much as Random House would ever think of for your next book. And when my next book turned out to be Prince of Tides, and she became the editor, she called me again. Now, let's see if you can write a book worth a million dollars. Do you remember I got 7500 for The Waters Wide? Nantalise was a brilliant editor. Uh, always, she always said that I was the hardest author she'd ever worked with because of my overwriting, and some of you in the audience may agree with her about that. For instance, she saw absolutely no reason to have a caged tiger at a gas station in the Prince of Tides, or a white dolphin either, for that matter. She wanted me to extricate them from the book. I loved those characters so much, I couldn't do it. I shoehorned them in any way. Speaking of shoehorning, Miss Sharon says that this is her favorite of my books. And she too has a first edition right here. Look at it. Um, but she loves Barbara Streisand, as do I, but she thinks Miss Streisand just ruined the book when she made a movie, directed and starred in it, left out all my Sharon's favorite parts. I'm going to defend myself here. I wrote a screenplay and several rewrites for the movie. But the producer called me one day and fired me. I said, why? He said, we don't think you understand the story. They paid me a lot of money to stay out of it. I think there was an Academy Award nomination because I stayed out of it. Don't blame me. But I do sometimes wish I'd understood the story a little bit better. 
Ms. Sharon wants me to do an excerpt from here, and we had a little bit of problem with finding one, not the caged tiger, Caesar, not Snow the dolphin. So we are just going to do a little snippet from the childhood of the main character, Tom Wingo. In the movie, he's played by Nick Nolte. He's in New York working with his twin sister's psychiatrist because his sister has decided to be suicidal. In telling about their childhood and all the things that happened, he's hoping to help with that. He gets involved with the psychiatrist. So in this little snippet, um, Savannah, his twin sister and Tom, and their big brother Luke, are visiting their grandfather. So here we go. I grew up loathing Good Fridays. That was the day my grandpa would go out to the shed and dust off the 90 pound wooden cross that he had made in a violent seizure of religious fervor when he was a boy of 14. And every Good Friday he would drag that cross up and down the street of tides from 12 noon to 3 o'clock to remind the backslidden, sinful citizenry of our town of the unbelievable suffering of Jesus Christ on that melancholy hill so many years ago. And every year, the sheriff, Sheriff Lucas, would write him out a ticket for obstruction of traffic. And every year, the Baptist Church would take up a special collection and pay the fine. And over the years, this had become something of an annual phenomenon that attracted pilgrims and tourists to our little town. The Colleton Gazette would have Grandpa's picture on the front. And every year, my grandmother would express her mortification by retiring to her bedroom on Good Friday with a full bottle of beef your gin. When she'd awakened to her memorial headache, Late that day, she would find my grandfather kneeling by her bed, praying for her sweet, boozy soul. On this particular year, we three kids had gone a day early, found Grandpa back in the shed, trying to put a tricycle wheel on the bottom of that cross. He was still of sound mind, he felt, but his body was aging. That maybe would help. And on Good Friday at noon, he was dressed in a white choir robe and brown sandals he'd bought from Kmart, and he lifted that heavy cross to his right shoulder. Halfway down the street, he fell for the first time, and it was a spectacular fall. He hit the ground hard. The cross fell on him. He loved the falls the best astonished the crowd, and he was a great staggerer, struggling to his knees and then his feet. At the stop sign, Sheriff Lucas stopped him and wrote him out a ticket for obstruction of traffic. And uh, Savannah and I had a lemonade stand in front of Sarah Poston's dress shop. And halfway through the walk, our brother Luke was playing Simon of Serene, he stopped Grandpa and forced a Dixie cup of vinegar between his lips. And when the walk was done, my Grandpa fell for real. And we half drug him to the lemonade stand, wiped his face with ice, gave him a glass of lemonade, and Luke kept saying over and over, you're so beautiful, Grandpa. You're so beautiful. Many years later, to my grandfather had passed away. It was Luke who would find that cross buried in mud and once again drag it up and down the street of tides. And it would be me who would always regret that I would never be the man my grandfather was. Halfway through the Prince of Tides, we moved back to uh, Atlanta because my mother was dying of cancer and I wanted to be with her. Also, I was frequently reminded by my siblings that I was the logical one to stay with her because I was the only one in the family who didn't have a job. 
We had to deal with Lenore's ex-husband again, and she was always on the phone screaming at him, and then she'd scream at me for no reason. I said, go scream out the window, scream on the roof, just not when I'm around. And then she became obsessed with the fact that my long-standing and trusted financial advisor was embezzling us. I couldn't stand her screaming about it. He had warned me that I had married a very expensive wife, but I don't like to deal with finances. I had ignored it. I could not ignore the screaming. I fired him. She said that she would become our financial advisor. <laughs> Big mistake. She got rid of every friend I had in Atlanta, and after my mother passed away, she insisted that we move to San Francisco to be near her perfect son, who was in college there. In San Francisco, I could not write in the chaos of my home. And I bought a little place on Fripp Island, which was my salvation, because all I had to do to be able to write beach music, which I had started, was to get on a plane and fly clear across the United States to my little hideaway. It saved my sanity, prolonged my marriage. Back in San Francisco, Lenore was enjoying my fame much more than I was. She was uh, lining up society people that she wanted to meet. She was planning social occasions where I was uncomfortable or bored. Parties, I just wasn't meant for them. I would have rather been a quiet, contemplative Trappist monk, just eating canned peaches praying all day. But she had an agenda. She'd spend days, weeks in the beauty parlor before every one of these occasions. I did not want to get divorced again. Didn't want to be a serial divorcee. I was afraid if I divorced her too, I would never see Susanna again. Now here's the conundrum about my marriage to Lenore. I wrote Prince of Tides and Beach Music while I was married to her. And I like both those books a lot. But in finishing Beach Music, I found that I needed to go on a very long book tour and make sure that book sold. Otherwise, I was going to prison for tax evasion. Lenore had brought me the tax papers, IRS, to sign two years in a row, but she didn't send any money in with them. I owed the government a quarter of a million dollars. And the divorce was happening. She wanted $25,000 a month to keep up her current lifestyle. I had to sell that book. But that's not the worst thing. The worst thing is I lost Susanna, as I'd feared. I wouldn't recognize her if she walked in that door right now. I didn't get to hold her. I didn't get to mold her. I see fathers with their daughters. I go weak in the knees. Losing Susanna was the worst thing that ever happened to me. She was baptized in the church of her mother. She did not try to get in touch with me when she was 18. That, my friends, was the worst. I had to sell that book, so I planned a long book tour. And I was in Dayton, Ohio, where I'd never been before. I looked up and saw my old shooting guard from the Citadel, John DeBros, and I yelled at him, Hey, DeBros, you ever been in a bookstore before? And he hollered back, Yeah, Conroy, once I was lost. Then he came up to me afterwards and he said, Come go home with me, Conroy, because my family don't think I know you. They don't think I've ever met you. And I said, Well, this is the first time I've ever seen you in my life. And then he told me, what a rear end I'd always been, and I went home with him. We had a great talk. I hadn't talked to him for 30 years. We talked about our final basketball season, and I began to realize how much that had hurt everyone on our team, not just me. We had a fierce, unrelenting coach who could break your spirit in ways it was hard to recover from. And no one had ever written a book like my losing season. I was going to write it. Nantalee said, basketball, a losing season? Pat, who cares? 
But the head of the department was excited about a sports book from me and I got to write it. And I got to travel around and talk to everybody on that basketball team. They had brilliant recall. They remembered things I hadn't even noticed. I sat and cried with one of my teammates who'd lost both legs in the Vietnam War while I was sitting over here writing books and protesting that war. It was very healing for me, I have to say. You know, military brats don't have the kind of past that the rest of you do. And I began to cherish my past because I didn't think I had one. I met Cassandra in 1995. I'd been in New York with Nantalese doing rewrites on beach music. And she turned to me and said, oh, by the way, you're going to uh, Birmingham to get an award. And I said, no, I'm not, because I don't want to, and you can't make me. She said, oh, Pat, we've already accepted. It's a Lifetime Achievement Award. So I went. And there was a party before everything else, and everybody seemed happy. Writers usually aren't, so <clears throat> I was having a good time talking to uh, a friend, Bill Cobb, who's a professor and uh, an author, and he suddenly said to me, I wanted you to meet one of my students, Sandra. And when he said her name, Cassandra turned, and he said, Sandra, I'd like you to meet Pat Conroy. She had a plate full of food and a mouthful of food, and she just spit out, oh, good gosh almighty in the vernacular of someone who grew up on a farm in southern Alabama, which she had. But we had a great talk. She was cute as a button. I, I called somebody the next day, and I asked about her, and they said, oh, you mean uh, Cassandra King? Yeah, she's been married to a Methodist minister for 25 years, happily. <laughs> well, I had said I'd write a blurb for the book she was writing, and I called her with it, and she told me she was separated and divorcing the reverend husband. You know, she put him through seminary and supported him all these years. Now she wanted to do what she wanted to do all of her life, right? And he said no. So we started dating, and it was soon and serious. I liked her a lot. I thought she liked me. But distance was our enemy because I was now taking care of my dad who was dying she was trying to finish up her book, Same Sweet Girls, great book, has my blurb on it. It would be two years before we finally married. And we bought a house on Battery Creek in Beaufort. We both love it. When I met Sandra, I knew she was right for me, but I didn't realize how right. She brought me a stability that I had never had before in my life. She surrounded me with calm. She didn't need rescuing. And she has allowed me to continue to write as I've become this bent, arthritic, crab-like creature, wandering the second story of my house, railing at the tides. Our book ends there, but there is a postscript. And it's important. Catherine Clark writes that in the spring of 2015, Pat Conroy received an email unexpectedly from his long estranged daughter, Susanna. And a period of reconciliation began. She joined her stepsisters in October at the Conroy at 70 celebration for his birthday. It would be his last. The next January, he called and identified himself as a soon-to-be-dead subject of her latest book. And this time he wasn't joking. He was two days away from a diagnosis of stage 4 pancreatic cancer and gone very soon, March 4th, 2016. He requested not only pickled shrimp, but he requested to be buried 
in a Gullah community on Helena Island in the cemetery of the Brick Baptist Church, which graciously allowed a non-Baptist, non-African American to rest in peace among them. His grave is modest, surrounded by loblolly pines and live oaks. There are no grandiose gravestones in that cemetery, no manicured gardens, just a few loving mementos scattered about, some faded red roses, some deflated balloons, a fishing pole or two. In his last years, he was writing bits and pieces, blurbs, blogs, and he always began them and ended them the same way. Hey out there, why do they not teach us that time is like a finger snap, an eye blink, and that we should not let one moment pass us by without giving joyous, ecstatic note to it? When I sat down to write, I wanted to commune with that voice of the mystery of poetry so that I could find that voice if I had it in me to talk to people like you. I felt like if I explained my life to you, maybe you were suffering too. When I sat down to write, I always recalled the last line of my favorite poem by James Dickey, Wolverine. It became my prayer. Lord, let me die, but let me not die out. I think that is the love song of every writer who has ever lived. Perhaps it's your love song too. Great love, Pat Conroy. Thanks, Sharon. That was really good. In fact, that was really great. Uh, it's hard to believe that we're down to one review left, but as you all know, we always know what the last review is, and that's our old friend Rosemary Rumley, so you got to be sure you're here next week. Uh, Rosemary is going to talk to us about the history of the world in six glasses, but as we know, when Rosemary starts on a book, there's lots of varied paths that she takes. So I'm sure it'll be a rollicking good time, and we'll look forward to seeing you guys all next week. Have a great week.